Het is iemand die hier al op het podium heeft gestaan met projecten rond onder andere Billie Holiday en John Coltrane, toch wel twee mooie of grote jazzgrootheden. Het is iemand die door Charles Peterson ontdekt is een aantal jaar geleden. Het is iemand die vanavond niet voor een uitverkochte AB-box zal spelen, want dat was initieel de bedoeling, maar het is later doorgegroeid naar een AB-flex, zijn grootste capaciteit waar hij in heel Europa voor speelt. Het is iemand die al met Flying Lotus, oftewel Captain Murphy tegenwoordig, uh, heeft samengewerkt, maar ook met Jeff Neven en Robert de Glasper. En dan wil hij toch nog altijd even afzakken voor Popwind en AB naar Huis 23. Please welcome, give him a hearty applause, Jose James. Be more than welcome again at the AB, of course. Thank you, thank you for everybody for coming. It's great to be here again and with the sun. <laughs> It will be the dark. That's. Uh... Hey, um, I mentioned roughly already, so a lot of people send in some questions. I'm going to ask some of them. Um, if they're extremely good questions, I'm going to mention... No, I'm just going to pretend they're from me. <laughs> if they, you don't want to answer them, I'm going to say, like, yeah, it's from the, from the girl up there. <laughs> or up there, so... Uh, um, one question I've always... Um, I don't know what to say. Do you actually say Jose James or Jose James? I tend to send the latter, but... Uh, well, the first one is probably closer, but it doesn't really matter, because... In every country, it's pronounced differently, so it's fine. So after seven times at AB, I have to call you finally <laughs> the other way around. So Jose James, okay. Um, there is one thing that you have in common with Paul Weller, with Brad Meldo, mm. with Loudon Rainwright III, with Eamon Tobin, and with, we looked it up in our uh, uh, database, and with Brad Meldo. Do you have any idea what might be the common thread between all those remarkable, amazing artists? Do they all love playing at Ancien Bosque? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. But they were all, uh, they all played here like not one time or two times, three times, four times, five times, but seven or eight times wow. during the last couple of years. I'm so in the club. I'm in yeah. the exclusive AB club. So you entered the top-notch <laughs> top range of art, international artists mm. in the last so many years, so that's quite a good... Um, also with McCoy Tyner. Uh, yeah, you played here yeah. with McCoy Tyner, with Jeff Neve, mm. with uh, a lot of people actually. Yeah, it's been great. Have you? What was the first thing you have something with Belgium? That's 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 obvious. Mm. What was the first thing you did when you uh, arrived in Belgium? The first show? No. What, what was the first thing you did when you arrived in Belgium? Because but today. Yeah. I took my jacket off finally. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so cold here. It's like unbelievably cold in Europe right now. So this is actually the first day that we sort of relaxed and felt like it's spring so thank you <laughs> <laughs> but apparently it seems to be like to talk in record company terms it's like this is your best territory ter territory i have the impression no oh uh, in a lot of ways absolutely you know um belgium and holland or the netherlands i should say really have supported the music from the first you know release from my first shows um playing here, as you just mentioned, playing at Paradiso. And I feel like uh, I've really been able to be more creative here and in the Netherlands as well. I don't know why the reception has been so great, but I really appreciate it because um, in a lot of other countries, it's harder for me to try different things. And that's just the artist that I am. So I feel like people don't get so confused here. It's like, oh, he's doing stanzas with Jeff, that's cool. He's with McCoy, that's cool. He's doing black magic, that's cool. But everywhere else, it's really a, actually a problem, which kind of sucks. So it's good to be, I mean, yeah, this is like, what, our seventh or eighth Seventh time. time? Yeah. Which is quite impressive. And everyone yeah. is totally different, so it's great, you know. If you have to, because tonight's going to be the seventh time you're going to be at the AB stage. Is there, like, if you can pick out one which might be artistically that you thought, like, this, is, this was really the best in my head or emotionally that you... Uh, a lot of memories about? The most emotional one was the Coltrane one, for sure. Uh, because, just because that was really like a dream project. I never thought I'd be able to do it. And then you offered to do it. And so it was like, wow, this is really a dream coming true. Um, I think the most successful musical one has been the Billie Holiday one, a year ago today. It's her birthday today. 
happy birthday. And, uh, you know, I, I've listened. That's the one that I've actually gone back to and really listened to a lot. I think that it makes sense because I've matured more and I had a more time to think about it. Um, and I think you've helped me, you know, really come into my own as a uh, sort of a producer in my own way, you know, conce conceptualizing an evening. Um, you know, if you remember, we had like a little table with wine. Yeah. With the wine, we kind of made wine. it like a club, you know, so it really, even for the musicians, that was cool because they felt like, oh yeah, this is, I feel like I'm at a jazz club. And that actually changed the, um, there's a little bit of theater that just really changed the feeling of the musicians on stage. So they weren't hiding in the, in the wings, they were just actually relaxing, you know, and getting a little drunk too. <laughs> And that uh, that gig actually got like four star reviews in the two major quality newspapers, you know, that's, and they're coming tonight as well. So that's uh, uh, yeah. I mean, that was everybody. That's support. my favorite so far because, uh, in terms of like a, the evenness, I think from the beginning to end, it was just amazing. And it's the exact same band tonight, so it should be fantastic. Looking forward. <laughs> There's plus, another plus link. Strings, plus strings. You, you have a lot of good friends here in Belgium. Lefto, for example, from Studio Brussels. In what way, if you should try to match like three words, three three emotions, or three yeah words that you want to link to Lefto, which terms would that be, or which words or uh, thoughts or super cool dude. <laughs> <laughs> if I'll give you an A, it's going to be a super cool dude. Yeah, I think I you know agree. it's. Uh, there's some special connection that I feel like I'm a bridge, you know, to be able to be friends with Jeff, to be able to be friends with Lefto, to sort of connect these two worlds. I think that's cool, you know, and they're all important for me. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that, you know, for example, Jeff recommended the string quartet was here tonight and Lefto plays my remixes. So it's like two sides of myself that are both important to me. And Jeff Neve sent me a text later on, uh, of earlier today, to give you uh, yeah, all the warmth and strength tonight. Have a great show, and he's yeah. in Paris tonight, so he only returns tomorrow, so he can't be here, unfortunately. Same. So that's. Uh, we had a lot of questions about your, um, of course, your influences, uh, about your a little bit your your yeah influences, people that you look up to. Um, what's probably your your uh, um, the person or the artist that made the biggest impression in the field of hip hop for you personally? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I think, you know, Diggable Planets really influenced me because of their, they had a very different... Um, it's funny because now, like, the sound seems very dated and, like, quaint and, like, oh, jazz and hip-hop, you know. But at the time, it was very, very... It was huge, you know. That's all anybody in my high school was listening to. And for me, it made jazz really cool again. You know what I mean? That was the band that introduced pure jazz um, in a very hip way. And I think the the combination of the three voices in that group was really cool. And the female MC. I was in love with her ladybug. Oh my God. <laughs> totally. Miss Mecca. She was like my high school crush. Um, and then later, A Tribe Called Quest, you know, really made a big impact as well. I really, you know, I really like, I really like, um, Bands like hip hop band, like the BC Boys, Tribe, Cypress Hill. You know, now we really have like um, solo artists, but I, I think hip hop has always been stronger, like as a community. Wu Tang Clan, you know, Odd Future now. I think it's, um, you know, the roots. You know, it's they're all a band, and I think that's the concept that I really draw on. Have you seen the uh, Tribe Called Quest uh, DVD that uh, just appeared I did, last year? I did. It made me sad, you know, to see them fighting and stuff. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, you know. I mean, all the all the uh, artists that I admired in the 90s and thought they would live forever and be have all either broken up or died, which is super sad. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I, I feel lucky to... Um, you know, I was watching, like, the... the, the who's the, the drummer from Nirvana? Um, the guy who's in Queens of the Stone Age. Uh, yeah. No, sorry, in uh, Foo Fighters. Uh, Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters yeah. uh, he did that really cool documentary. They were talking about... hip hop, soul, and jazz here. So, what about rock? <laughs> well, he did that cool documentary about that studio where they made um, in utero. Yeah, uh, Foo, uh, help us out. The LA one. Sound City. Sound City, thank you. 10 points. And, you know, it just, it just really was a magical time. 
you know, when you would have, you know, Nine Inch Nails, you had Nirvana, Soundgarden, the Beastie Boys, yep. Public Enemy, all, you know, equ I think equally represented on the radio. And I definitely, I listened to all those people. Yeah. And Midnight Marauders from Tribe Called Quest is one of my favorite uh, rap albums of all time. Yeah, so. absolutely. Hey, let's move on to the field of soul. Who's the, who was the biggest influencer for you or um, which artist? Male, maybe female? Stevie Wonder, actually. You know, Stevie, especially early stuff. You know, I, I think a lot of young artists or anybody, usually we start on compilations, right? You know, so Best of Motown or whatever. So Fingertips Part 2 and stuff like that. Um, but Stevie is really the one who I think really as a writer, I mean, I love Marvin, but as a writer, Stevie really understands jazz and higher theory in the, his playing and his writing. It's the most sophisticated R&B music, you know, of all time. Absolutely. Hands down. I still agree. Yeah. I mean, there's nobody, he's, he's like, he's the genius of soul and R&B. You know I mean? Obviously Ray Charles is the the genius of but um stevie i think has made the biggest impact yeah because you can't escape him i mean you, you try to write music and you're like oh he's already been there he's like coltrane he's he's done it all you know what i mean yeah so i think it's it's kind of weird because everybody reveres stevie but i think in a way he sort of gets overlooked in some interesting ways mm -hmm. yeah so one more field to go let's go and move on to the field of jazz Ooh. Was your biggest influence, or let's say, if you wanted to be like that certain jazz musician in the history of jazz before you were born, who would that be? Uh, well, the first, the really the biggest impact that I had was from Charlie Parker and uh, Duke Ellington. I mean, I think as a soloist, as a stylist, Charlie Parker is really the top. You know, like he was really the one who was the most avant-garde and the most, uh, I don't know, sophisticated, but also like very melodic. You know, you could follow his stuff and nobody else really could do that. You know, he was like Michael Jordan or somebody, you know, like all the great people around him looked up to him and even they were amazing, but he made them look normal. You know what I mean? So he really jumped out at me um, when I was like 14, 15. Yeah, he started me on that whole path that led to Coltrane and everybody else, you know. The godfather of bebop. Yeah. I was listening to an, uh, to an album of Trap called Quest a couple of days ago, The Low End Theory, and it starts roughly with like, uh, listening to hip, hip hop, my daddy used to say it reminded him, him of bebop. Yeah. So it's like jazz and hip hop are pretty close to each other. So I think so. That's uh, for sure. Hey, when, when did you first realize like, um, it might be a bizarre question, if you think so, it's, <laughs> the question came from the audience. If not, it's mine. It's, uh, uh, when did you first start like, hey, it seems like I have t a talent or I've got talent and I can do something with it? Uh, that's a good question. I think... Um, Thank you, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. I think I always knew I was creative, but... You know, it's very, it's very, you know, when you're in high school and they're like, guidance counselor, they're like, let's talk about jobs. You know, there's never artist or musician or something. You're always talking about banking or, you know, normal stuff. So it just never really sort of was a reality. I mean, my father's a musician, but he was sort of like the one person in my entire family who does anything musical, seriously. Um, so I, I don't think I ever really thought about it as a career until I was like 17, 18. But I definitely knew from 14, 15 that I had a talent um, just because I was in choir and, you know, I started to get noticed, you know. Um, I think my voice doesn't blend well either. So I'm singing in choir and it stands out, you know. So I think that's how I first got sort of recognition for music, uh, which was great. And sort of started with that, you know, but I never really, it took me like another four years for me to say, actually, maybe I can do this as a career, you know. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always seems like a weird moment, like when you realize I can do something, I can entertain people with it. So, um. hey, we had a lot of questions about uh, your 
collaborations, of course. Um, you work together with Flying Lotus, with Jeff Naden, of course, McCoy Tyner. Is there anyone whom you would like to work with in the future that it's on your wish list? Absolutely. Um, I'd say Karen Bailey Ray. She's fantastic. I think she's sort of like, if I have to pick one singer who's sort of similar to me out there, she's the closest. You know, she sings without processing. She works with a band. Um, she's kind of a mix of pop and jazz and soul. And she's super sexy, too. So <laughs> That's quite um, important as well. You know, I'd really like to do something with James Blake. I think he's great. I've, I've loved his stuff as a producer for years. And um, I think what he's doing is really fresh. Can't wait to hear the new album. Um, and there's a lot of producers, you know, that I really like, like Floating Points. Um, I mean, some of my collaborations are with remixes, too. So there's a guy, Flacco, who's in London who did a great remix. Um, Taylor McFerrin did a great remix for me. So even if I don't sing on tracks with producers, I still try to keep that side of myself um, so I can just kind of stay relevant in all kinds of music. Yeah. Well, uh, James Blake will play here later on this year, so we'll ask him. Awesome. If <laughs> there might be something in the pipeline. So, um, Is there anybody whom you uh, asked already to collaborate with and who reacted like, nah, I don't think so, not with you, or? Sadly, <laughs> yes. Oh, actually, I, yeah, I actually asked Portet to produce oh. my next album, and Kieran he said him. no. Oh, so. what an asshole. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I, I love his stuff. I mean, he just said he was too busy, which is the case, which I didn't think it could happen, but you have to ask, you never know. The AB is a no-go zone for Kieran Hedman from now on. <laughs> <laughs> if you touch, touch him, Kira, etc. Um, a few more questions that uh, that we got from uh, the people from Poppins. Um, somebody wrote, um, "I have a particular way of of, of uh, enjoying jazz or my jazz experience." And he said, "Like, not the goal is important." Uh, but the miles you're traveling, and the miles you travel by all senses, hearing, seeing, feeling, tasting, and even smelling, that's how we described experience, the jazz experience. What's your jazz experience, or how do you experience jazz? Oh, uh, like performing, or like in general? I don't know if the person who sent it over this question is here, no? <laughs> oh, see? So yeah, in general. In general. Uh, I think jazz is like, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but it, it is like wine to me. It's like when you first taste it, you're like, oh, people drink this? Like, you know, as a kid, you just, you're not, your palate is not sophisticated enough. And I truly think that jazz, like real jazz, is like that. You know, I don't think there's really, outside of like Thelonious Monk or something very, you know, kids love Monk for some reason. I don't know why, but they love it. But. I remember when I first heard jazz, I totally didn't understand it at all. But I was fascinated by it. It was kind of like, oh, there's a music out there that I just don't get. Why not? You know. So it kind of compelled me. But I think most kids, you know, my age or younger, kind of hear jazz and they're like, well, oh, it belongs to a different time. It's complicated. Uh, you need an attention span. You know, it's not made to understand at once. You know, I was lucky enough to have an entryway into it through Duke Ellington hearing Take the A Train. That was, that was my moment, you know, where I was like, oh, okay. There is like a, not a simpler form, but sort of a more easy form of jazz. That I was like, then I discovered Swing and Ella and all that stuff. Um, but I think if you put on like Eric Dolphy for somebody, they're gonna be like, okay. You know, like, it's cool. But so yeah, for me, you know, I can really, you know, appreciate it. And, and it's interesting for me now because I've gone through such a Coltrane phase, listen to all his albums and study stuff. And it's only now that I can sort of appreciate him as a saxophone player. And I've been listening to him for like, God, I'm gonna age myself right now, 17 years or something like that. And, you know, it's, it's, I, can, I can now listen to it without having like an emotional experience at, at just music. So. At least for me, it's been sort of like this maturation of, of listening. Uh, another thing is, <clears throat> I think a lot of jazz artists, when they made their masterworks, they were a lot older. 
So it's a different kind of reference. You know, a lot of hip hop guys or Adele, for example, you know, she's a kid making these big albums about kids' emotions. And Miles Davis was had been around the world a billion times and been divorced and fell in love with Julia Greco and had a heroin problem. You know, he'd been through a lot of super heavy stuff before he made Kind of Blue. So do you know what I mean? It's kind of a different thing. Yeah. yeah. I read the whole Penguin Guide to Jazz. You know the big guides? Yeah. Brian Cook, Richard Morton. That's uh, my way of uh, entering the whole jazz world. It's quite kind of freaky, but... Uh, we had another question. Uh, which advice would you give a young musician to achieve their goals? Uh, I think just two things, you know. Focus on... Focus on your strengths, you know, not your weaknesses. I think the biggest sort of um, problem that young artists, and I, I went through it as well, you're so self-conscious about yourself anyway, as a teenager or a young adult, and what your peers think. You know, you, So you end up doing a lot of things, maybe playing or writing or singing a certain way to make other people like it. Um, and if you look at Miles Davis, he wasn't a great trumpet player when he started. He couldn't play high, he couldn't play fast. Couldn't really play that well at all. And he could have said, all right, I'm never going to be Dizzy Gillespie, so I'm going to give up, you know. But instead he said, well, let me look at what I can do and exploit that. And that's what he did for his entire life. He essentially played the same way from a certain point for his entire career. But he changed, he used his genius as an arranger, as a composer, and a conductor, you know, to really change his sound, which is really amazing. So I think... You know, focusing on what you do well and just sticking with that is always going to be your best thing. Otherwise, it'll just drive you crazy. <laughs> Take his advice as a mantra in your head. That's what I suggest. I found a very good question between the ones that we uh, received. Um, there was someone who came to the uh, John Coltrane tribute and he or she asked, like, uh, I never see you play with a score, even long sessions such as a tribute to John Coltrane. Do you have such a good memory or is it more about improvisation? Uh, I, I think that um, unless you're a classical artist or, you know, so-called whatever, to have, like, a score on stage is very amateur, you know. I think that um, unless you're reading some super difficult piece that you just can't memorize, um, I think it's sort of a disservice to the audience because you're staring at a piece of paper, not at the people or inside yourself. So I wouldn't feel comfortable going to see an actor and they're reading a piece of paper, you know? So for me, it's the same thing. It's like, if you don't know what you're gonna do on stage, then you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Not to say it always goes the way I want it to. <laughs> I do agree. Another question, we're going to New York within a few weeks. In which jazz club should we go? Village Vanguard, you can answer this. The Village Vanguard, Monday night, uh, you took me to the Black Cat, I think, last time. Oh, Fat Cat. Yeah, yeah. Fat Cat. Fat Cat. Um, I think the Vanguard it was the oldest standing jazz club in New York. Um, and every Monday they have the, you know, formerly known as Thad Jones and Mel Lewis Big Band, now the Vanguard Orchestra. Uh, and to me, it's the most authentic jazz experience you can have now in the world. I mean, it's just... The sound is tremendous, and you're in the place where Bill Evans and, you know, Coltrane and Miles all played and made their classic albums, Sonny Rollins. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's, it's like the most jazz experience you can have, so, and go early, because it fills up fast. And buy tickets in advance, too. <laughs> Which music is on your iPod right now? Um, Hindi Zara Handmade, which... I hadn't, I hadn't actually put the whole album on for a long time, um, so I'm just rediscovering that. Um, uh, Lou Reed, uh, Transformer. Hopefully not the one with Metallica. No, not that one. Um, Velvet Underground, uh, Junip, Jose Gonzalez's band, Machine Drum, uh, Leon La Havas, Fortet. <laughs> uh, what else? 
I think that's those are like the the more recent ones that have been on there. Um, I tend to listen very obsessively, especially when I'm making, writing an album. I don't really listen to too much outside music, so um, I listen to a lot, but not a lot ends up on my my uh, iPod. If that makes sense. And they all performed here, but not the Velvet on the Ground. Although Lurie played here, John Cale played here, Sterling Morrison and Mo Tucker. So it's, yeah. So. Oh, we're all <laughs> Maybe if um, we're running out of time, I have the impression, is there anybody else who would love to ask a final question maybe or uh, to Jose James, as I shall call you from now on? <laughs> seven times. We've been here seven times. Did you finally manage to try the Belgian French words? Uh, <laughs> no, because I don't eat beef and I know they're cooked in beef usually. So that's my thing. Also, I also kind of, I know they're amazing, but I have to take my diet so seriously on the road. Um, like for example, I'm playing six weeks in a row and I have two days off total. So I basically eat the same boring thing every single day, which is fish, rice, and salad. That's it. <laughs> but I know they're amazing and my band always eats it. <laughs> One more person would ask, uh, like to ask a final question or some. You, yeah. you? Uh, could you tell us what was the first record you bought? Uh, Purple Rain. <laughs> Prince. <laughs> yeah. By Dave Grohl. Oh, sorry, Prince. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, last one? Oh, you had your hand up there. Um, I really like the way you play with Save Your Love for Me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I really like it. And when you decided to include it, did you listen first to the Nancy Wilson version? Absolutely. Absolutely. She's, that is the version, you know. What I tried to do with that is, um, like D'Angelo always has one track, nodding back, you know, cruising or uh, feel like making love, and put it in that hip hop beat. I said, let me do the same thing with jazz. So that was my sort of like, trying to, trying to take that and make it contemporary. And I think it worked. And actually, Junior Mance, I don't think I ever told you this, he was in the studio, and I was really proud of it because I thought it was so cool, you know? Because when I brought in the song, all the guys were like, you want to do Save Your Love for me? Like, how? And I told the drummer just to play this beat, and everyone was like, oh, they got super excited. And we did it, and Junior came in, and I said, Junior, I got to play this, man. And he listened to it, and everyone in the studio was like into it, and he was like, he leaned over, and he was like, because I had reharmonized it, too. He's like, you know, the piano player's playing the wrong chords, right? <laughs> I was like, oh no, I, I, I reharmonized him. He's like, oh. <laughs> and I never heard about uh, Junior Munch before, uh, but you mentioned him when I was in New York a couple of years ago. And he's a famous guy. He worked with Charlie Parker, if I'm not wrong. So um, yeah. I discovered him because of you. So yeah, he's thank amazing. You again. All right, thank you so much. I think we have to let uh, Jose James go to uh, do another part of this rehearsal before giving a great show to uh, actually the biggest crowd he will ever ever played so far at AB and yeah. even uh, worldwide so far for an indoor show. So yeah. thank you so much, man. Thank you.